Thank you, Damien, uh, for the introduction. So I want to start with a, a few words of, intro, uh, of motivation. Um, in the last decade or so, or 1.5 uh, decades, Lettuce-based uh, crypto has become uh, very, very popular. And if you search for reasons of why that is, people usually say, you, you'll see a combination of uh, the same reasons, um, which is usually a combination of the following. On the one hand, lattices are very powerful. They allow us to construct things that we don't know how to do otherwise, for example, fully homomorphic encryption and <coughs> um, IBEs and, and things like that. Furthermore, they are at least up to this point believed to be post-quantum secure. Finally, they also uh, enjoy some, some very strong guarantees in terms of average case security, which stems from worst case to average case reductions. And they also allow for simple and efficient implementations because in the end, it's just usually matrix vector multiplications over relatively small integers. And if you go to the ring setting, you might have to multiply ring elements, but still the arithmetic is usually over small integers and fairly simple, right? Well, there's a caveat here, and this caveat is the discrete Gaussian sampling, which is an operation that is part of many lattice-based um, crypto schemes. And when it comes to discrete Gaussian sampling, I would say you can have either simple or efficient, but not really both. And this is what our work addresses. Um, before going into uh, detail about how we do that and what we do exactly, I want to quickly define what this discrete Gaussian sampling is. So discrete Gaussian sampling is our algorithm that sample from a specific distribution. And this distribution is a discrete Gaussian. First, we define the Gaussian function as e to the minus px squared. That is a standard Gaussian function. And you can define a, uh, a scaled and shifted version of it by defining or giving a parameter c and a noise parameter s. So c is called the center. s is usually the noise parameter and you just shift and scale the distribution, uh, the function. And the discrete Gaussian is then simply a distribution that is proportional to this Gaussian function, um, but restricted to a discrete set. In our case, it's going to be mostly the integers, but you can have other sets there. And I have visualized this, um, this distribution here. Like um, These are your elements right on the x-axis, and every dot corresponds to the probability of each of these elements, and you get your typical bulk curve here. Note that the center does not have to be an integer, even if um, the distribution is restricted to the integers. And in fact, you can view discrete Gaussian sampling as a rounding procedure that rounds the center to a nearby integer corresponding to these, uh, to these probabilities. OK, now where do we encounter the discrete Gaussian in lattice-based crypto? Well, it usually comes to us in one of two settings. Um, in one setting, the, which we call the fixed setting, the parameters of the distribution are fixed. So the, um, the center S and the noise parameters, the center C and the noise parameter S are fixed once and for all throughout the system. And this is used in most LWE-based schemes where the center is zero. If you are familiar with LWE, learning with errors problems, the errors usually follow this distribution, the centered discrete Gaussian with a fixed parameter s. Now, in the other setting, which we call the generic setting, um, both, both parameters, uh, the center and the noise parameter, can be variable. So they vary per query. So uh, when, I ask for, when I ask the algorithm for, for a sample, I specify the center and the noise parameter, and I want to get back a sample from that specific distribution. Um, yeah, from this distribution that is defined by the C and this S. And the most prominent application of that, um, of that setting is lattice trapdoor sampling. And lattice trapdoor sampling are very popular in more advanced schemes of lattice-based crypto, um, usually for uh, encryptions in the, uh, for CCA in secure encryptions or signature secure in the standard model or IBE schemes, et cetera. So this is where lattice trapdoor sampling comes in uh, most of the time. And we have actually quite a few algorithms for the fixed setting. So um, <clears throat> in the fixed setting, uh, there are several algorithms that achieve different time memory trade-offs. And they usually achieve that by doing pre-computation based on this, uh, the center and the noise parameter, which are fixed, right? So they are fixed, so you can do pre-computation and you can store information about this. Um, 
And the most efficient algorithms, for example, they store all the probabilities for every element in your support of this distribution um, in a table, and then your sampling just becomes some sort of randomized lookup into that table. Right? And so they store information that is linear in the noise parameter. So this is good for small distributions. As the distributions grow wide, this becomes impractical. But there are different algorithms that achieve different trade-offs. In the variable or the generic setting, we don't really have that up to this point. And you can see kind of why, because if you don't know the center and the, um, and the noise parameter of your distribution, then what are you going to pre-compute, right? And um, in, in our work now, what we actually do is we uh, reduce the generic setting to the fixed setting. So we'll exploit algorithm uh, for the fixed setting in order to generate um, samples from arbitrary distributions. And before I go more into detail about uh, how we achieve this, I want to go over the structure of the algorithm and tell you about uh, why we think that is a good idea. So the high-level overview of the algorithm is going to be that we start with two fixed samplers. Um, here, we are taking samplers over 2z uh, with a center 0 and 1. Alternatively, you can think about them as being samplers over z um, with a center 0 and 1 half. Doesn't really make a difference. And these don't get input. They just uh, produce samples from their fixed distribution. And um, then our algorithm is, oh, wait, no, nope. yes, sorry. Our algorithm just takes these samples, gets as input the center and the noise parameter, and then cleverly combines these, um, these samples these from the fixed distribution in a way to produce the correct distribution. And um, why do we think this is a good, good idea? Well, on the one hand, we can ensure that the noise parameter of these fixed distributions is going to be relatively small, or actually quite small. It's just a constant. And so we can take advantage of the most efficient algorithms for the fixed setting. These are fixed distributions to, um, without spending too much memory. Right? And so this is going to make our algorithm quite efficient. Furthermore, um, we are not restricted to two samplers. If we have more memories to spend, we can add more samplers, and this will make our combination phase actually much more, uh, much more efficient. So this is where we get a time memory trade-off for, uh, for the setting of generic sampling. That's actually the first of its kind. Furthermore, we see that these samplers don't get any input, right? They are completely independent of the C and this S. This means you can split the algorithm up into an offline and an online phase. The offline phase simply produces these samples. You can pre-compute them or store them somewhere. And then the online phase just combines these samples together and using very simple arithmetic. And so the online phase of our algorithm is actually extremely fast. And so this allows you to, to split this algorithm and, for example, just do pre-computation uh, and store it on a device, for example. If you have like, a small device, you can just store your samples there. And, like, um, or, for example, you have a web server that has idle times where you can just produce, in, produce them when the web server is not doing anything else. <clears throat> Or you can actually separate the, the algorithms in two separate systems, where this is done, for example, in a hardware module that is specialized to this setting. And we have algorithms that, are, that run really fast in hardware for the fixed setting, not so much for the generic setting. And so um, and if you do this in parallel, well, then again, the offline phase is, is basically for free. <clears throat> and last but not least, um, this we ensure actually, or our algorithm naturally ensures, that every output sample of our sampler uses the same, some, same amount of base samples. So the input for every query that we, that we give to our, um, to our sampler, the number of base samples that it consumes is exactly the same amount. And actually, the number of steps is naturally the same amount. So <clears throat> the online phase of our algorithm is sort of naturally constant time. And if you implement the arithmetic operations in the sampler in constant time, you immediately get a constant time online phase. And then separating out the offline phase or sampling these in large badges um, will give you very easily a constant time algorithm without paying a large penalty in, uh, in efficiency. And that is actually quite unusual for discrete Gaussian sampling, which has been traditionally hard to do in constant time. And yeah, so there you have it. That's the, the three adjectives 
that we claim the paper. It is uh, our sampler is generic. It <coughs> it can be implemented very efficiently, and it can also be implemented in constant time without uh, much much overhead, hardly any overhead actually. So. Now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, how we actually achieve this and where these time memory trade-offs and this offline online phase comes from. So our main tool is going to be convolution. And there's a bunch of convolution theorems in the literature. And th <clears throat> they all kind of have the same, the same flavor. You start out with two or more um, base distributions. These are fixed, it's like uh, D1 and D2. And you produce a sample from each of them. And then convolution the theorems tell you that you can combine them in specific ways to generate a different distribution. So if you combine the samples from these distributions, your output is going to be a different distribution. And you can see how this like, might help us, right? If we have like, fixed distributions, if we combine them in the right ways, we get out different distributions. Now, getting out the correct distributions that we actually want is um, not trivial, but <coughs> Yeah, actually, it requires a lot of work. Otherwise, this wouldn't be a crypto uh, presentation. But um, <laughs> so it's not entirely new, this idea. So it has been used before in the fixed setting. We call that the most efficient algorithms require storage, linear, and the noise parameters. So if you have a fixed distribution that has a large noise parameter, you can use this con convolution to reduce the memory overhead to produce samples from a, from a smaller distribution and then combine them into a big one. And that has been used before. We um, generalize, generalize this idea a little and analyze this in the more general setting. And we use a similar technique to make sure that our base sampler has small noise. Right? And so this shows that we have some leverage with regards to the noise parameter. What I want to focus on in this talk, though, is the second parameter, how we handle, um, how we handle different, uh, different centers that we get as input. And for that, um, we call that the goal of, or the view of um, discrete Gaussian sampling is that you get a center and you try to round it to a nearby integer. But instead of doing that in one step, what we're going to do is we're going to round the center step by step to a coarser and coarser grid until it is um, in the, like an element in the integers. And this is going to be the output sample. And this, each individual step, we're going to make sure that this every individual step is being rounded by a discrete Gaussian. And then the convolution theorems are actually going to tell us that the final result is actually also going to be a discrete Gaussian with the correct center. So <clears throat> I know this is uh, a little vague, but I don't, unfortunately don't really have time to go much more into detail. This is just to give you a sense of, uh, of how the algorithm works. And so now the question is, how do we do every individual step just using our fixed number of uh, base samplers, just using two base samplers. And um, well, the idea is we <coughs> assume that C, like our center that we're giving the parameter, is an element in Z over 2 to the k. So it has a k bit binary expansion. And our goal is for this step to round it to a center in Z over 2 to the k minus 1. So we want to round just the last bit by a discrete Gaussian. And we do this by um, sampling our base, or drawing a sample from our base sampler with center defined by the bit, the last bit in, in the center. right? And we draw the sample, and then we add the center back to it and scale it by 2 to the k. Now, <clears throat> note that x is actually a, sample, a, center, a sample in 2z. So it's not actually in z, it's in 2z. And so x plus bk um, over 2 to the k, the last bit of the new x is actually going to be also bk, right? Because uh, x is an even number. So if bk is 0, x remains even. If um, bk is 1, x is an odd integer, right? And then if I scale it by 2 to the k, the last bit is going to be the, exactly bk. And so if we subtract it from c, um, <clears throat> the, last, the last bit of C is going to be 0. So C is actually now going to be in 2 to the k minus 1, which was exactly the goal. And this is actually a valid uh, discrete Gaussian rounding. And so we do this step by step and until um, our C is actually going to be an element in Z, and we get exactly a discrete Gaussian uh, with the correct center. 
OK, now where do our uh, time memory trade-offs come from? Well, it mostly comes from the fact that you don't have to express C in binary. You can express it in different bases. So <clears throat> for example, if you express it in, um, with, with regards to base 8, for example, then this means you have a third of the digit, right? Like every, every three bits are going to be transformed into one digit um, in base 8, and then you can round every, every digit individually, and you're only, only going to make a third of the steps. But now you need uh, samples not over 2z, but you need it from 8z, and more so you need it for every possible coset of 8z. So you need uh, 8z with centers in 0, 1, 2, up to 7. Right? So you need seven samplers, uh, eight samplers, which you know, like you need more memory to store these efficient samplers, but your, um, your combining algorithm is going to run in the third of the time. So there is a time memory trade-off. <clears throat> the constant time algorithm essentially stems from the fact that no matter which center we get, we use the same, we need the same number of, uh, of steps, and this comes um, from the idea that we can assume that the center uh, has a finite bit expression no matter which base you use. Um, and the fundamental idea of why we can assume that is that we don't actually need to necessarily um, produce a correct output distribution, but it's, it's OK if we just approximate the, the output distribution, the, the ideal discrete Gaussian. And most algorithms actually do that. Most algorithms don't produce the exact distribution. They will um, produce an approximate distribution. And this is usually good enough. But good enough, you have to kind of quantify, right? So <clears throat> um, there are several tools out there to quantify this, this security to approximation trade-off. And the most classical one is a statistical distance, um, which has been classically used to, to evaluate how close you need to be to the, um, to the discrete Gaussian in order to preserve security. And the, the statistical distance is actually a very nice tool to use in the analysis because it has a simple definition. You can get easy bounds on it. And it is a metric, which makes it uh, very easy to analyze even um, yeah, more complex algorithms <coughs> that involve a lot of steps that can lose distance to the ideal distribution. So and this is very nice. But more recently, the KL diversion has been has becoming more um, popular or other divergences, actually. I'm choosing the KL diversion as a more popular tool, but other ones are possible. And <clears throat> KL diversion, as the name say, says, is not a metric. So it's a little harder to use. But if you do use that, you could get actually a much stronger security proof out of it. And the, like one of the killer arguments for the KL divergence is that you can, in many settings, you can get away with just computing with, for example, 50-bit floating point numbers, and you get more than 100-bit security out of it, like a bit level of more than 100 bits. And that is, um, if you think about current hardware, or more, if you think about current computer architectures, that is a very strong argument for using the KL divergence because that gives you an order of magnitude speed up versus um, versus uh, multi or arbitrary bit precision numbers, uh, which you would require 400 bits of security uh, if you were using the statistical distance in order to analyze your, um, your distribution. And so um, <clears throat> so we wanted a nice tool to, to analyze our algorithms, and we also wanted strong security. Um, so what we did, we, we were hoping to try to get something the best of both worlds. And we ended up defining our own metric because we didn't find one that suited our needs. And this one has a pretty simple definition. It's just uh, the infinity norm of the uh, difference of the logs of the two distributions. And as it turns out, um, this, is, um, this is a metric. You can see that because it's uh, just a, uh, yeah, it's a version of the infinity matrix, or it's an infinity norm of um, the infinity norm of, of a function of the, um, of the difference vectors. And then you also get the uh, strong security bound, actually. We show that in the paper. So showing that this is a metric is actually not that hard. Showing that it has strong security um, properties is actually a little bit more involved. And we do that in the paper. And then we use this max log distance in order to show that um, 
our algorithm actually achieves good approximation even for floating point numbers. And you get strong bounds on the max, max log distance because in the regime where they are very small, it's essentially equivalent to the relative error, which is exactly what floating point numbers give you. So if you have a 50-bit floating point number, um, then you exactly get a, an approximation error or relative error of 2 to the minus 50, and then your ML distance is also going to be pretty much 2 to the minus 50. Okay, um, this is all I actually planned for, but I have a few more minutes, so allow me a couple of remarks. First, um, in a follow-up work, actually Thomas Preis showed that um, by relating this max log distance to um, different divergences, like uh, Rennie divergence, um, that our algorithm actually uh, has much stronger security properties even if you uh, restrict the bit security definition a little bit. And also, if you're interested in, in our algorithm and like more in a practical sense, we do have a reference implementation uh, on my website, Google my name and UCSD, and you'll find it. Okay, now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.